So we'll go ahead and get started. Um, Hannah, good question about food dyes. Because food dyes and, and synthetic food additives in general are are always a topic of conversation, controversy, right? Yeah. Um, there, there and because <laughs> part of part of that is is bad science because scientists design studies. Sometimes scientists can design studies to get headlines, not necessarily to do good science. Um, and even a bigger part is, the, is science journalism is awful at that. It's designed to give you clickbaity headlines, um, well, not to actually answer the questions. When I was like researching this, it kind of like I was really skeptical. A lot of like the studies, like the first study I found was like basically saying there's a link between food dye and autism. And I was like, that's. <laughs> Uh, that sounds like the whole vaccines cause autism right. thing all over again. Right. Um, so, and it seems like, and this is just mostly found by looking at Wikipedia. Um, but if you if you look if you look at Wikipedia articles that are well sourced um, and that bring up both sides. So this is just the food coloring page on Wikipedia. And when you go to the criticism section, it's got a bunch of studies in both directions. Um, and it seems like for the most part, they, there's a, it's a mix up of correlation and causation. Yeah. There are a few times that studies have been able to show that food, food dyes are correlated with some of these behavioral problems or these, a, these neural, neuro atyp, atypical atypicities, I don't know. Are you neuro 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 divergences. That's a better way. Um, but it's really easy to mix up correlation and causation, especially with population studies, right? And because it could be that you know something as simple as um, households that are more likely to feed their children food with lots of synthetic dyes in it are also low income homes. And so it could be tied to income more than it's tied to the food dye, or it could be tied to, um, you know, some very, very specific geography, like the, the, you know, there's a certain mineral in the water here that interacts with the dyes in a certain way. Because the one that the one that it talks about that has the most um, evidence was was in the UK, and they found out that these. Um, these had an effect on children in the general population in Southampton in England. Yeah. But they weren't able to extract that to extrapolate that to the general population, which to me either means it's a very, very weak link if there is one, or there's something else going on. Um, and so it's it's one of those things though that's always always in the in the headlines because. That's something that nobody is quite sure about yet. There is a lot of stuff that could be happening. Um, yeah. From what I read about, like, and I did read a little bit of the Wikipedia, and, yeah. like, about a uh, fine gold study. Mm -hmm. And it just seemed like there was, like, really shaky evidence for everything. And the reason was uh, to do uh, another like big study on it, it would take a lot of money. And the FDA had kind of already made up their mind that they were safe from the studies that were already out there. That's, and, and you do have to be worried about, especially these days, with what's called government capture, which is, or um, in is it government capture, industry capture, industry capture, when, they, when, when people get appointed by the government to run these federal agencies that are in charge of regulations, if they have conflict of interest, you can wind up essentially with the industry that's supposed to be regulated, controlling the regulating agency. Um, yeah, right, exactly. But this, that's one of the biggest problems, and I will get just slightly political here, um, but I don't think anybody would disagree that, that the biggest problem with Donald Trump's cabinet that he appointed 
um, was the fact that they were all industry insiders from the industries they were supposed to regulate. And so they got appointed and immediately dismantled everything. You look at what happened with the EPA under Trump, you look at what happened to the FDA and even the CDC, um, although the CDC stood up the best, um, especially given how the pandemic worked out. Um, it's, you know, it is a problem. You have to be concerned about um, is the agency actually regulating things the way they're supposed to? In the case of the Feingold study, though, that was back in 73. And at some point since then, the FDA might not have given the money for a larger study, but the NSF, the National Science Foundation, or the NIH, the National Institute of Health, or some foreign research entity um, would have given money if there was actually justifiable if there was a grant proposal that actually was sound um and so the fact that so maybe you could say okay well the fda didn't give fine gold follow-up money and that's because of a conflict of interest the fact that nobody gave him follow-up money is really pretty pretty damning um in terms of nobody thought his results were stood on their own enough to give him more money for another study or they, and this is probably actually more likely, they did, and none of those follow-up studies ever proved the link he was trying to prove. Um, and those don't make headlines. Negative science doesn't make headlines. Um, so, you know, nobody's ever going to publish a headline that says, synthetic food dyes vindicated, fine gold was wrong. That's just not a headline that you're ever going to see, right? Yeah. Um, those, those studies... And because you can't prove something doesn't exist. You can prove a correlation is there, but you can't prove that there's no correlation because there's always going to be some other variable that maybe you didn't take into account. It's like trying to disprove Bigfoot. You can never disprove Bigfoot, right? All you can do is say there's no evidence for Bigfoot yet. So with that in mind, it's, it's definitely one of those things where synthetic food additives you need to be careful of. Um, maybe there's some some things going on there, but it's definitely not something that um, is you know worth rearranging your whole life around um, for for the most part. And there are some things like my my son grows up when he has um, red Gatorade and but not blue Gatorade. So is that a reaction to the red food coloring? Probably not, because he eats red Skittles and he's fine. You know, so, but there are some weirdness there that who knows exactly what's going on, specifically Gatorade. He can drink Fanta, he can drink strawberry Fanta with red food coloring in it, he's fine. But red Gatorade sets him off. So it's, it's just really tricky. And it also, the, the science journalism reminds me of a good um, rule of thumb for journalism. I can't remember what it's called, but the, there's a rule in journalism that's, that states that anytime some you a headline is written as a question the answer is always no um because if you could write it as a positive statement they would but if you see things like do food colorings cause cancer no because if it was true if they had that link they would write it food colorings cause cancer yeah it's usually no or if it's uncertain at best it's uncertain right um and they write it as the question because maybe the answer is yes so everybody reads it but it's not usually the case. Um, this was Miranda's question about, about uh, chemistry of blood tests, blood glucose tests. Um, I don't know specifically, I'm interested in watching this series. So I think it's on Netflix about, no, maybe it's Hulu, um, about, uh, about this Stanford, I think it's about the dropout. Um, this Stanford student who dropped out to start a company to, to um, design blood glucose tests for diabetics. And basically it was just a huge scam um, where she was able to keep getting venture capital and turning it into bigger and bigger publicity, but she never actually had a work prototype. Um, and it's a really good example of why people that want to do startups in the medical or chemical industries need to start with the bachelor's. It's not one of those, like there are some industries where a high school degree and a good idea is all you really need to get started. 
chemistry and medical, the medical field is not one of those areas really. And so I, I frequently have students that take Chem 100 and, you know, I've got this idea for a startup. Um, okay, cool. Let's finish your bachelor's first. When you're in grad school, then we can, we can talk about your startup. Um, because that's usually how it goes. You get your startup capital typically gets started from grant money, which get that transitioned into venture capital money. And then you leave grad school and do your startup or you work on your startup while you're in grad school because you need that foundation to really be able to understand what's really going on. If you leave as a first year Stanford student and try to do a, um, you know, a medical startup, you're gonna run into issues. Um, so I don't know the specifics about the chemistry behind blood tests other than the fact that um, if you're trying to make a really cheap test, you're going to have really high uncertainty, right? And if you have really high uncertainty, you need a lot, a larger sample so that your uncertainty is a smaller chunk of that total measurement. If you're measuring, you know, blood glucose levels at, you know, five milligram or five micrograms per milliliter, um, plus or minus five micrograms per milliliter, that's not adequate. Right. And so a lot of it stems from how we need enough of a sample that you can say that your uncertainty is low relative to the measurement itself. And blood sugar is one of those things that you want to keep an eye on, especially if you're diabetic, to a pretty accurate level. Um, so that's my guess. I haven't actually done done the um, research on it, but you also have it's it's trickier than just testing for glucose too, because you have other sugars present um, at the very least you have some amount of DNA present. It's not a lot of DNA because red blood cells have, um, they've had their nucleus removed. They don't have a, a um, nucleus that has DNA in it, but there's still RNA and there's still white blood cells that have DNA. Those, so those are all filled with ribose, right? Which is a sugar. So simple tests just for sugars are gonna get conf confused by all those other sugars that are present. If you're specifically looking at glucose, that's a lot trickier. And so that's probably where some of that uncertainty comes in. It's not just as simple as, well, I can do a test for reducing sugars and that will tell me how much glucose I have. So really good questions though this week. I do know that uh, with, with uh, like at hospitals, like they, they run a uh, they like to do a spectroscopy in order to uh, measure like all the different like enzymes and uh, you know like chloride levels and acid levels yeah and that's <laughs> when you're when you're in a hospital that's that's the ideal way to do it is you run it and it works just like a, a gas chromatograph except you do it with a li liquid sample with a solution and you can get you know really low uncertainty and know exactly what everything is when you're trying to do some, you know, a finger prick test for blood glucose, that's a lot trickier because you don't have all that machinery. So you're trying to design something that can ignore everything but glucose, um, which is a really tricky chemical problem to do with one drop of blood as your sample. Um, this one was, was relevant to our mechanisms we've been looking at. Um, so methylene deoxy, groups are is when you have a single carbon attached through two oxygens to something else. And you frequently see these attached to benzene rings. Um, and they have, they show up a lot of places. Um, pesticides, food additives, natural food products. Um, MDMA is methylene deoxy methamphetamine. So if you take methamphetamine and you add this group to it, um, you get MDMA. So these, what is it about these that makes it so stable? Because essentially that group is an acetal. Right, you've got two oxygens, uh, two ethers attached to a single carbon, right? So that is an acetal. So what is it about this acetal that makes it relatively stable? Well, the answer is it's not 
all that stable. Um, you can take compounds like this and you can make put them into their salt form by protonating it the amine um, in something like like MDMA. So that would look like it's one, two, three. may have an extra carbon there. That's pretty close to MDMA. Um, but you've got it, there's your methyl group on the amine. So that's what makes it methyl amphetamine. Um, you can protonate that, give it a positive charge and then make a salt with it and just to store it. Um, so the question is how, why can you do that without breaking up this group here? It seems like that group should be subject to hydrolysis, like we've been talking about, right? The answer is that it is. The key is gassing with dry HCl. If you just use HCl with water present, you're gonna break that group up and you're gonna, you're gonna go through hydrolysis um, and wind up with a mixture of formaldehyde and methamphetamine. If you do this with dry HCl, and that means that you're the only nucleophile that you have to work with is chloride, which is a weak enough nucleophile that it won't, um, it won't be able to attack this. Even under acidic conditions, you can protonate these oxygens, but it's not going, the chloride is not a strong enough nucleophile to be able to attack there. And plus you have the fact that this is a better base than those oxygens are. So as long as you, as long as it's not, you know, more than a stoichiometric amount of HCl, you're going to protonate there. And then your chloride doesn't really have a valid target because these ones are still unprotonated. If you applied like three equivalents of HCl, even if it's dry HCl, you probably would get that ring group breaking up a little bit. Um, because once you protonate all of the amines, the only thing left to protonate are those oxygens. Um, and then you could maybe start seeing chloride as, as a strong enough nucleophile to attack there. Um, so it's, li it's likely that you, you do see that just, but that's why there's dry. You dry it and minimize that. Um, but it is absolutely a group that is, there's a, there's a reason why, um, well, I guess put it in economic terms, there's a reason that meth is cheaper than MDMA because it's a lot easier to make meth than it is to make MDMA because you, you have to protect that acetyl group if you're trying to make MDMA. You don't need to worry about that. You can just flow through and use Le Chatelier's principle to make a whole bunch of product without worrying about your other functional groups when you don't have any of these functional groups over here. When that's not there, it's a lot easier to make that molecule because you don't need to worry about the protected Is there groups. some like difference like that between crack and heroin too? Because crack is so much. So crack and cocaine. The crack and cocaine, yeah. So the only difference between, so the, and it's the same term as, um, uh, the more technical term is freebase. So cocaine is typically referred to as powdered cocaine is cocaine hypochloride which means it's in the protonated form as a, as a salt that's soluble in water. If you take it and you deprotonate it, you turn it into free base cocaine, which has a low enough vaporization point that you can just heat it and it can be inhaled that way. Um, but it is, there's, that's the only, literally the only difference between powdered cocaine and crack cocaine is whether or not you smoke it or snort it or inject it. And it's just based on the solubility based on pH. Um, so it's, it's one of those things that, um, that makes it really, really clear that there's, uh, there's underlying reasoning for having difference in sentencing guidelines between crack and powdered cocaine. Um, it's because it's literally the same molecule and yet the form that is found predominantly in low income areas um, in minority areas has a much higher mandatory sentencing guidelines than the form that's predominantly consumed by upper class, um, mostly white people, right? So there really is, there's no scientific basis between having a difference in sentencing guidelines 
um, between crack and cocaine. So it's it's really a huge injustice um, in that regard. And I, I remember the first time I re realized that. It's like, oh, okay, maybe systemic racism is a thing. Um, you know, it's not really any, any way around that when you see a few examples like that. And we'll get away from the politically charged topics today. <laughs> and we'll go back to, you missed us talking about industry capture as well. Oh, and, uh, yeah. and the Trump, Trump cabinet picks. Oh, yeah. Um, but yeah. that also was a, a train wreck just from the environmental point of view. Yeah, yeah, true thing. Anyway, let's talk about the products that we get from the quiz question. And in today's mostly, we have one more mechanism to add for carbonyl, um, for class two carbonyls. And then we're going to just do a whole bunch of practice and synthesis problems with, um, with these class two carbonyls, uh, just to get that all this volume sort of cemented in our heads a little bit. Um, should we start with the Wittig reaction or should we save the tricky one for last? All right, no, let's start with, let's start with it. Okay, so the, the overall Wittig reaction, we can recognize that because as soon as we see the, that phosphorus, the triphenyl phosphorus, that's our key, that is a Wittig reaction. And the reminder, reminder that what we're going to do with the Wittig reaction is we're basically going to swap whatever is attached to the phosphorus for the oxygen. You basically are just going to do that the little two-step where you switch those around. You make a four-sided um, intermediate. So the only real trick here is to make the E or the Z. Right? And if we're just drawing the product, we don't need to worry about drawing that four-sided intermediate. Um, this is definitely one where I don't think drawing the mechanism is helpful when you're just trying to do the reaction. It's helpful for maybe for understanding what's actually going on, but it's a heck of a mechanism to get to, to a fairly simple result. Um, so that the real question just becomes, okay, well, we're going to make either this molecule or with the phenyl on the opposite side. Remember pH is phenyl, so benzene, right? So those are our two choices. And so we just have to recognize, okay, that benzene ring, because it's a conjugated double bond, is gonna be electron withdrawing. And electron withdrawing groups predominantly give the E. So we would expect this one mostly. So the standard reaction puts the, and, and this is a really fast backwards way of remembering this, but bear with me. The standard group makes the sterically hindered product. So the electron withdrawing group makes the opposite. So I kind of go through in my head, okay, well, wait, I remembered it was backwards. It's the, when it's a standard alkyl group, it makes the opposite of what sterics would predict. And then the electron withdrawing group makes the opposite of that is the way that I go through it in my head, which is convoluted. I will give you that. Um, but that's, that's the way that I can remember it. Whatever works for you in your head. Um, it's, but it's a little bit like with, with the deals all the reaction, you just had to remember electron withdrawing groups predominantly made the endo configuration because of those pi pi interactions. It's just one of those things that you have to, you have to remember. Um, and again, out of the four points on this test, you got the wrong stereoisomer. That's at least three, if not three and a half out of the four points. If you did everything right, but got the wrong stereoisomer, that's the bulk of the points.
Um, and I also remembered why I had those problems hidden on the examples. Um, it's because I had, was saving them to use on the, on the quiz. So you may have recognized that some of those problems that had previously been cropped out that we did in class on Thursday showed up again, like that one. So in this case, we take, this is a hydrolysis, we're gonna take that acetal and convert it back to a carbonyl. And so it can be helpful, let's see, vanilla. That's a pretty, it's a pretty bad, So this is our starting molecule. We're going through hydrolysis. We're going to break that bond and that bond. And the carbon that has two oxygens attached to it. Remember that these hydrolysis reactions are not redox reactions. So we still have to have all the same number of oxygen bonds. So the carbon that has two oxygens attached to it still needs two oxygen bonds. So we're going to turn that carbon into our carbonyl and the others just turn to being alcohols. This is definitely a case where redrawing everything in the same spot could be helpful. And it still looks really funky. But from here, once we have that product drawn, we can take this and rearrange it and say, okay, well, let's count one, two, three, four carbons in a row to get to the carbon that ends in the aldehyde, or the carbon chain that ends, starts in the aldehyde. So one, two, three, four, there's the aldehyde, and on carbon four is an OH, then we just have to figure out, okay, on the third carbon from the aldehyde, we have another one carbon with an OH attached to it. So one, two, three, let me number these, one, two, three. We're gonna add So that looks like a very simple molecule to make as complicated as the structures we had. But that original structure wasn't complicated because there was a lot of carbons, just that they were arranged in a complicated way. And if you're unsure if you did that right, count your carbons. So your total number of carbons originally was only, was only five carbons. It was only, a, you know, it's a six-sided ring with, one, with two sides of it that are bridged. So even norbornene is still only seven carbons total. That's a rather deformed looking norbornene, but just if we're counting that one, two, three, four, five, six sided ring, with the seventh bridging the gap. So it's not a huge molecule, it just looks complicated because of the way it's attached. Any other specific questions on any of the rest of these? If you don't have your notes in front of you, you can feel free to work, work your way through them again.
So the third one is just the phenyl group attaching to the carbonyl, you turn it into an alcohol. This one, you're going to turn the, the sulfur, or sorry, the aldehyde into a thioacetal and then immediately reduce it. So you're just getting rid of the, the um, oxygen entirely. So you wind up with just methyl butane as your product. Um, if we have hydrogen and a primary amine, we're going to make that imine, which is the nitrogen double bonded where the oxygen is, just with an R group still attached. So it would look like that. In this case, if you have an acetal, and a carbonyl and you expose it to a Grignard reagent, one of your groups is being protected, the other one is not. So your phenyl group is going to add here, turn that into an alcohol, and then step two is adding H3O plus, you're going to protonate that oxygen to make the alcohol, but then you're also going to turn that group back into being a carbonyl. So it gets a little bit tricky if you want to, if you have two carbonyls, one of which you want to, to reduce and the other one you want to keep the way it is, it gets a little tricky as far as how do you protect one and let the other one still react. Um, and probably you would wind up with a, the best you could probably do is a 50-50 mixture. You started with the diketone added the protecting group and then separated your products. Half of them should be protonated on one spot, half of them protonated on the other, roughly. Um, there are some ways, for both of these, these are both ketones, so, so it'd be a little bit tricky to figure out a way to, to protect one of them and not the other. One's an aldehyde and one's a ketone, that's easy. It's pretty easy to protect the aldehyde and then reduce the ketone. Um, it would be a lot trickier to protect the ketone and reduce the aldehyde, but it's still a possibility, likely. But probably in that case, we'd wind up with a case where you know maximum yield is going to be fifty percent, because you just have to to protect one of the groups and then separate everything. It's a lot easier when you have two different functional groups than it is when you have the same functional group twice. All right. So let's talk about our last reaction in this chapter, which is the Bayer Villager oxidation. Um, and I'm going to double check this at break, but I believe that, that Bayer is the same Bayer that first synthesized aspirin. Um, so Bayer aspirin is named after the German chemist who first synthesized aspirin. Um, they just made it more palatable to America by making the spelling less German, um, by removing that, that E. And if it is that guy, he is not a particularly um, admirable character. I believe he's one of those chemists that worked very closely with the Nazis during World War II. Um, although, no, I'm mixing him up with one whose last name starts with a K. Um, this is the one, he was a German nationalist, but during World War I, not World War II. So not quite as bad, I guess, if we're, if we're ranking human rights violations. Um, he's not quite up there with, with Kuhn um, and, the, and some of the more well-known Nazis. Um, but this, this oxidation, this oxidation winds up being pretty useful because it's a way to very selectively convert a carbonyl into being an ester or a carboxylic acid. So effectively, you just have a, um, peroxy acid and that peroxy acid 
acts, the, the oxygen in the peroxy acid acts as a nucleophile to make this, is the, um, this one is the, the more complete transition state um, or uh, intermediate rather. Whereas so this part that I'm gonna circle in red, that was the original carbonyl. And so this is, this is technically a nucleophilic addition reaction like we've been talking about. It's just using oxygen as the nucleophile in a very specific way. And so when they use oxygen as a nucleophile, it winds up making this peroxide bond that's super unstable. And what happens is you wind up with a, with a rearrangement um, that turns it from being from one molecule having three oxygens and the other molecule having one oxygen to each molecule gets two oxygens because then there's no peroxide bonds, right? So the net result is you take your carbonyl and turn it into an ester. Basically just insert an extra oxygen in there. That's only possible with the peroxy acid because that peroxide bond is so unstable on its own. Which seems, okay, maybe not, maybe simple is the wrong word, but it doesn't seem that tricky. Um, other than what do you do if all of these R groups aren't the same? And the, the most common uh, molecule that gets used for this is the is peroxyacetic acid. It's a really common peroxide. It's really cheap, easy to store. It's a liquid, um, works pretty easily. So that's the, the most common one. But what if these two R groups aren't the same? If you have R1 and R2, how do you decide which side gets the oxygen and which side doesn't? And the, the answer is that it, it all depends on which one of will migrate first. So one of the ways you can look at these mechanisms, so I haven't emphasized it too much yet, um, but anytime you've got a series of reactions, reaction steps where you've got equilibrium reaction, equilibrium reaction, not an equilibrium reaction, that's because that's the slowest step. That's the step with the largest um, barrier, transition state barrier, which means that's your rate determining step. And so since our rate determining step is the rearrangement, those two R groups, the identity of those two R groups, R1 and R2, is going to determine which one of them moves faster. In other words, which product you get. So, this is a little bit like talking about carbocation stability. Um, and it's a little bit like talking, talking about carbocation rearrangement too, is we refer to what's called the migratory aptitude. And migratory aptitude literally is just what is going to migrate fastest. And it has to do with a combination of what's more stable and what's the smallest. So it's what's most stable as a carbocation. So it's related to carbocation stability, except that we get this H at the front of it. Other than that, it's the same carbocation stability we've been dealing with. Tertiary is more stable than secondary or phenyl, which is more stable than primary, which is more stable than methyl. But even more stable than a, than a tertiary carbocation is just an H plus. So between the H plus as being smallest and the most stable as a carbocation, the, 
net result is that the hydrogen migrates the fastest. And other than that, you can think of it as just like our carbocation stability. So if we have a choice between R1 and R2, if one of them is a hydrogen, that's the one that migrates and you make the carboxylic acid. If one of them is tertiary and the other one is secondary, the tertiary carbon will move. And I actually think that they have, but so this is a, it's a little bit weird because it follows our rules for carbocation stability, but it's really in our group bringing a pair of electrons with it. So it's, it's moving like it's a carbon ion, but according to the, our carbocation stability. And that's why we have a separate term for this. We don't say carbocation stability or carbon ion stability. It's migratory aptitude because it's really kind of a weird combination of the two. All right, so with that in mind, let's practice this reaction. So what are our two R groups for A? Put the oxygen on either one of those spots, right? So we've either got a tertiary carbon migrating over. I guess really that's a, really a secondary carbon migrating. If you think about cutting the bond where I drew that those red lines, it's a tertiary carbon migrating. It's um, so we'd be moving this whole thing versus this. So in general, more substituted is going to move faster. So that means that our product is gonna look like that. So, and just to recap, since I didn't make it explicitly clear before, this tertiary, secondary, primary methyl is referring to the migrating group as it's migrating, not the way it is already. Because if we're looking at, we call that a tertiary carbon, the way it is, but it's not, it's not tertiary when it's migrating. We're only moving, when the carbon's moving, it only has two carbons attached to it. So that's a, a secondary carbon for the purpose of migrating. And the way that I knew, know we have to do it that way is because there's no quaternary on our list. Right? A quaternary carbon that looks like That would be the most substituted carbon you could have, right? And so this group as a whole migrating, that's a quaternary carbon, but only a tertiary carbon when it comes to migrating, because we're not moving, we're not keeping all four of those carbon carbon bonds, we're only keeping three of the carbon carbon bonds. That'd be the best way to phrase that. And the group that's moving on the right side is a methyl group, even though it's a primary carbon, the way it's currently attached. So just, and I may have just made things more complicated by, by getting it explicitly clear with that, but hopefully it headed off some confusion down the road.
All right, so for B. Our two R groups are an H or a secondary carbon. So what should move faster? Yeah, so that's gonna be the one that moves faster. So everything else stays where it is. We just add an extra oxygen on that side. So it's either going to be, you add the oxygen where the hydrogen is, if it's an aldehyde, aldehydes will always give you the carboxylic acid when you do this. And beyond that, whatever is most, whatever the, the most substituted carbon is, is going to be the one that migrates. So down here for C. That one's our more substituted carbon, right? So that's the carbon that's going to migrate, which means that that is where we're going to put the oxygen. We're going to put the oxygen in between carbonyl and that larger one, or the more substituted carbon. All right, so we're going to go from a five-sided ring to a six-sided ring. And for the most part, everything stays exactly where it was. Except we add that oxygen. Right, and so if you're, when it comes to most of these products is pretty easy to draw with these ring structures, it can be a little tricky because we're changing how big the ring is. So in that case, it can be helpful to sort of draw it, add your oxygen into the right side, and just make sure that you remember you're getting rid of that. It's not turning into an epoxide. You have to make sure that it's very obvious that you're scratching out that bond and then you can count the ring structure that's left and redraw it. Right. So while we're talking about odd, odd sized rings and right before break, I think I have I have two methods for drawing regular heptagons um, that get me close. And I think the new method that I just discovered, I like, I like it better because it applies to nonagons as well. So what I used to do for hep regular heptagons is draw half of an octagon and draw half of a hexagon and connect them together. So there's my half of a hexagon. And then if I draw half of an octagon, like I'm drawing a stop sign, and just connect them together. That gets you pretty close. Um, I think the way that I like better is if you if you start by drawing the bottom and you draw the carbon right that's going to be right at the top. You just need to add. So that's three carbons, right? So you need to add two more to each side. Both get you relatively close. Um, but this one where you start draw the bottom line and then draw one at the point at the top, you can also do that for a nonagon as well, which is really hard to draw. Otherwise, that might even be harder than a hexagon. You just have to add three. One, two, three. That's it. If you wasn't able to get one, two, three. That still doesn't look very good. It's a circuit gone, yeah. Circuit. <laughs> this is the, the 
the trials and tribulations of teaching organic chemistry. You have to have a method for drawing a number on. All right. So that's our last new reaction here. <coughs> so let's take a break. Let's come back at nine o'clock and we'll recap the other nucleophiles again and just do practice. We should run through a bunch of practice and then do some synthesis problems. So let's come back at nine. Oh really? Yeah. Sweet, but they're and they're done with calibration too. Yeah, they they were. Uh... No, it is, it was space based, the Spitzer one. But it's just not nearly the same size. That size of a telescope versus the James Webb.
Yeah, we do. There's like uh, somebody took video of us playing with Davis and shared it with the uh, Grace. Each file is like over a gigabyte. So it's not this way to Yeah, it's just it just downloaded it like what is it, megabytes per second. Better so that out in the um, on the Wi-Fi in the in the chem lab. Which is the, some of the slowest internet on campus. I still got 11 megabytes a second yesterday. So, and if you, if you ever need to download something bigger than that, go to the that office. I think we have some we have some Ethernet ports, and it's real quick. Internet at my house is uh, maxes out. So it used to max out. At, uh, 50, 500 megabytes per second. And then after the uh, Tamarack fire, they had to go through and replace all the phone lines so they could build, start to build a market. And that gave the speed boost to our like 750. Yeah, that's that's the thing that's adequate at home. Yeah. Um, it's I, I uh, do it faster. Yeah. Well, that's that's one of the first things. Yeah. Um, one of the the first things that I when I had money that I could actually spend and was not relegated to um, making do. One of the first things I spent money on was no, we're going to get real internet. Like not doesn't have to be that. Turns out, especially at Tahoe. All the vacation homes mean that nobody pays for the second tier internet. Everybody pays for the cheapest internet because if it's your second home, who cares if it's a little slower than your internet at home, right? You're only using it a tiny fraction of the time. So if you go one level up, nobody uses that ever. If you go the cheapest internet is good all week, but then on the weekend when everybody gets up here, the speed goes to crap. Um, but if you go one level up, nobody ever uses that band. And and uh, it's worth the extra twenty dollars a month, especially since we're not paying for cable to have that. Because we get, I get close to the same speed at home that I do here, um, which is really nice for for streaming, especially considering during the pandemic. It's like okay, we're running three zooms and Netflix at the same time on the same router. <laughs> yeah, that, that works. That doesn't work for us. Yeah. And still, it would get bogged down occasionally, but it was for the most part we could handle that. Um, and mine wasn't the one that really cut out because because my desktop is plugged into the router with an actual port and not on the Wi-Fi because I'm not asleep. Do you know what chemical causes the smell of fresh cut grass? Leaf compound chemistry did a piece on that. A lot of people love that smell. And I don't like it. <laughs> and I just walked out to like grab a snack from my car. Green and leaf volatiles. Okay. Yeah. yeah, it is. There is a compound chemistry about it. Yeah, it smelled like they had just cut the grass up there. Aldides. So when you cut grass, enzymes break down fatty acids. It's in the higher resolution. You make linoleic and linolenic acids, but then their enzymes take those and chop them up into smaller pieces. So we have fresh cut grass is Z3 hexanal and E2 hexanal. They also stimulate formation of new cells at the site of the wound, um, which is interesting. So it's basically a, a green DP scab. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Mm -hmm. I don't think I've ever met someone that doesn't like that. I don't like it. <laughs> it's 
it, it's like the smell of rain. The smell of rain is one that very briefly is pleasant, but generally speaking, I don't like the smell of, of when rain first starts hitting like hot pavement, it has that certain smell. Once a year, I like that smell. More than that, not so much. But that's that's just because I you know, grew up in California where you know, get yeah, rain once a year. Size plants. I would have wanted it all. It is fun to download some of these really, really large um, files. Downloading the, the Hubble Ultra. Actual photo here in full size. Is very, very large, and it's just a huge amount of data that you can then zoom in on and go a long way. Um, so some of these really large photos are a lot of fun, and that's in that one. I think it's good. How long does it take Hubble to like transmit its information back there? Hubble's pretty good. It's not that far away. Um, it's in, I'm not sure if it's still considered low Earth, Orbit, it might be a little bit further away than that. It's got to be low Earth orbit because the International Space Station can rendezvous with it to do repairs and stuff. Um, so it's pretty close, and and it does use you know has significant satellite satellites dedicated to it. So it translates transmits its information pretty well. There was better version of this that was larger than anyway um beside the point just fun psa thank you Rigney. new james webb image comparing to the other infrared telescopes this one the spitzer irac is actually another space-based one but its light capturing size is about this big as opposed to James Webb, that is roughly the size of this room. It's just light capturing size. I want to say it's it's like 10 meters, 12 meters across in diameter, something like that. Um, so it just has so much more light capturing ability that it has much higher resolution images, which is how you get these, the difference here. Same spot in the sky captured with the James Webb versus that the other leading infrared space telescope. So fun stuff. And there's just something more awe-inspiring about seeing like nebula and gas clouds like this compared to just as like pixelated noise. It just is does not carry the same amount of majesty and as uh, as it does when you can actually see that that's not just noise, it's a uh, nebula. All right, so brief recap. Our oxygen base, so these are the nucleophiles for our nucleophilic addition reactions. We could add peroxy acids here. It's not strictly speaking a nucleophilic addition reaction, the bayer villager oxidation, because it's an oxidation and you don't break the carbonyl bond. But it is acting as a nucleophile, so you could technically put, put uh, the peroxy acid in here as, as an oxygen nucleophile. It's just going to be an oxidizing agent. It's where the first step is a nucleophilic attack um, compared to these others that don't actually oxidize. But some of them do reduce. For instance, the hydrogen and the carbon nucleophiles are reducing agents um, for the carbon that they attack. So I suppose if we're counting them, we better count the 
the oxidizing agent too in the interest of, of uh, symmetry. All right, so one of the textbooks, I don't think this is our textbook, but one of the textbooks that I've taught in the past yet is um, just gives a series of reactions where she says, okay, acetone reacts with these. Um, so it's just a good big pro, um, practice problem where we go through all the different possibilities. So start from acetone. I'm gonna clean this up so that we have room to draw on the right-hand side. So start on the left-hand side here, and work your way down. Tell that I that uh, I'm a chemist because my Google autocomplete when I type in P A E um, is not anything from Urban Dictionary or something like that. It's bare villager oxidation. Turns out there's just too many German organic chemists from the late 1800s for me to adequately keep track. track. It's not that Bayer. That Bayer founded Bayer Pharmaceuticals, which was originally founded to make dyes. And so it was a different German chemist who first made aspirin for Bayer, but it was not the same Bayer we're talking about today who won his Nobel Prize for his work in dyes, but he's not related to the other Bayer 
found in Bayer pharmaceuticals. So before pharmaceuticals were a thing, um, if you were a chemist, there was money to be made in making synthetic dyes so that you didn't have to grow indigo um, or other, other dyes. You could actually you could just make the dyes in a lab. Um, that was a lot cheaper. And since indigo and other chromophores were really, really in high demand, that was a very good income source. So for the first three, A, C, and E, A is going to turn it into an imine. C turns it into an acetal. E turns it into, it's not an oxime. Is it just the A side? A side is three nitrogens. So I don't remember exactly what that functional group is. The important thing about that functional group is that it usually is immediately reduced to, to just the alkane. Hydrozone, that's it. Yeah, so an azide is when you have three nitrogens in a row attached which is even more unstable, but it's also useful because that can go through a Diels alder reaction, or cycle addition similar to a Diels alder reaction um, with a dienophile. So if you had that reacting with this, you can get a cycle addition where you wind up attaching those and making a five-sided and it winds up being, if you use an alkyne, you wind up making an aromatic cyclic group. So it's more or less irreversible. It's a really stable molecule. That reaction is called the click reaction because it's used to irreversibly link two molecules together. You can actually do that. You can modify two enzymes, one enzyme to have an azide hanging off of it, the other enzyme to have an alkyne hanging off of it. You can irreversibly link them and it'll actually stay linked even in physiological conditions. So you can basically, it's, um, they call it a quick reaction because it's like a, like buckling a seatbelt. It goes really fast, irreversibly, it stays attached. So that you can do things like attach green, let green fluorescent protein to some other protein that you want to track through a living organism. And then I'll just shine UV light on it, wherever it glows green is where that protein went. Um, Yeah, UC Davis does click chemistry. A lot of places you see UCSD actually, um, Bertozzi um, did a, there's a guy named Bert. So that was one of the reactions that I did my grad school research on um, because it turns out this, that the ab initio calculations for cycle additions are really tricky because they're multi reference, meaning that you have more than one orbital chain, more than two orbitals changing at a time, which means you can't just use simple computational methods for it. So they knew that this reaction worked, but nobody could calculate the right barriers for it um, in ab initio calculations. Um, yeah, that's and it's a it is a fascinating field right now, at least for those of us who are in the middle of that field. All right. So questions about these first these first three, easy peasy. 
Good. G I and K. Well, G hydride source, right? Just take our acetone and turn it to isopropyl alcohol. I, we have cyanide as our nucleophile. So we're going to make a cyanohydrin. And that hydrin term gets used. I, I realized this the other day, we were talking about the cyanohydrins. Um, the other place that hydrin term gets used is if we attach a halogen. To the same carbon that had an OH group, we call that a halo hydrin. So a hydrin just means an OH group attached with another functional group attached as well. Um, so a cyanohydrin, a halo hydrin is probably, you know, you could call it a, a, um, a diol, you could probably call that a um, hydroxy hydrin um, and not be technically wrong. There's just a better name for it. And a reminder that this, the cyanohydrin can then be, that cyanide group can then be either reduced or oxidized. It's oxidized, you turn it into, it's not technically an oxidation. Um, you can either turn that into a carboxylic acid uh, if you put it under acidic conditions, or you can turn it into, you can reduce it all the way to an amine if you put it under reducing conditions. And last but not least, the Wittig reaction. And it's, so there's our molecule that we're attaching. So we're attaching an ethyl group on one side and a hydrogen on the other. So our two options are this or that. Which one do we make? Your question. Yeah. So we had two distinct things on the top. But at the bottom, we just have two methyl groups. Those are, you can't tell the difference between those two methyl groups. So we don't, we would only wind up with one product because those are identical. So to get E and Z, you need to be able to tell the difference um, between the two substituents on both sides of the alkene. It's kind of like a weird geometric part. It does. All right, let's do the evens, BBFHJL.
So the nitrogen nucleophiles are all more or less the same with one exception, and that's that secondary, you have a secondary amine acting as your nucleophile, you get the enamine, which again, goes through the same mechanism, but you wind up making something where your double bond is not in the same place. And so B and F both look the same as what we see in, in other places. You add your nitrogen, make a new double bond between your carbon and your nitrogen. And whatever is attached to your nitrogen is still attached to your nitrogen. Um, whether that's another nitrogen in the case of the hydrozone, um, or if it's an oxygen in the case of the oxygen, or if it's a carbon in the case of the imine. If it's two carbons, then you don't have a good leaving group to make that second bond. So you kick off an adjacent hydrogen and you wind up making an enamine. Right, so out of all the nitrogen nucleophiles we have, that's really the only truly tricky one. That and remembering that those hydrosomes can then be reduced. Any question on those? Um, as far as the stereochemistry goes, if you do have the possibility of making an imine with that has an E and a Z conformer, it's I don't think it's any more complicated than the favored product is the one that's that's less sterically hindered. Um, and since most of these reactions are reversible anyway, it's not going to get as locked into one conformer as as alkenes do. For H, here's our Bayer Villager oxidation. So the net result is you take your carbonyl and you add an oxygen onto one side of it. And since this one acetone is symmetric, we don't need to worry about which thing, which side is moving. But in general, it's either going to be the hydrogen or the more substituted carbon is the one that actually migrates over. J, we have Grignard reagents. We just wind up reducing to the alcohol and adding whatever, whatever our Grignard reagent is. In this case, ethyl group gets added to the carbonyl carbon. And L, good old hydride sources. Make the isopropyl alcohol, which I think was on. We didn't have that one on this. On the first one. And the, and the Sodium borohydride works just as well. I mean, probably not just as well, but also works and gets adequate product and won't catch on fire if you leave the lid off. Leave the lid off. There are lots of benefits to living in a place with low humidity when it comes to chemistry. Our green yard reagent doesn't spoil a week later, and the sodium will spontaneously combust. <laughs> What's that? It makes up for all the altitude problems. Yes, it's true. Yeah. Nice full of trade offs, right? Okay, that's fair. Didn't completely spoil. None of us got money. We all got remarkable yields. One way or another. We got remarkably like low. All right, so a couple of review problems.
how do we know what's going to be a better and more reactive compound? That's the key, right? The stronger partial positive charge means more reactive. So electron withdrawing groups are going to make it more reactive or fewer electron donating groups. So for A, we have electron withdrawing group and an electron donating group. versus the same electron withdrawing group and a hydrogen, which is not really electron donating or withdrawing. It's just sort of there. It's, it's our, we call that our zero point. So which one is going to react more rapidly? The aldehyde or the ketone? Yeah. That electron donating group, that methyl group is going to give extra electron density to that carbonyl carbon, which means it's not going to be as attractive to a nucleophile. You've got acetone or hexafluoroacetone. What's going to have more electron density on the carbonyl carbon? one that doesn't have the electron withdrawing groups, which means this one more reactive. Yes, the, so fluorine is very electronegative, so those are strong electron withdrawing groups, but at the same time, it doesn't have the resonance electron withdrawing. So it doesn't, it would not be like a nitro group would be even more strongly electron withdrawing. Um, but that's going to be pretty electron, pretty reactive. And again, it's, and it's really hard to put a, you know, a number to it because there is that exponential relationship between activation energy and, and rate. Um, so it's a little bit hard. All we qualitatively, you can definitely say it's going to be more reactive. Exactly how much more reactive would be. Not subject to debate, but it depends on how you measure it. Let's see, we did some vitig reaction. Um, some vitig reaction practiced earlier, but probably worth testing again. So in both cases, I think it is. So we already looked at this one. In our electron, we have an electron withdrawing group, which means we don't make we're going to make the E conformer, right? Walk it through in your head. It's electron donating, it makes the sterically hindered product. So electron withdrawing makes the sterically favored product. I don't know what you're talking about. It's not the same, same reaction at all because I drew out the benzene ring this time. So for the second one, we have an ethyl group, which is electron donating. So it's not E versus, or so it's, we're going to make the sterically hindered form. So
There's our product. This winds up being a really, really useful in terms of making specific isomer you want as well, though, because we now have a way, if we have a carbonyl attached, that's an electron withdrawing group, right? So that would put it in the E conformer, but we have a way of then converting a carbonyl to a fully reduced carbon. So if we wanted to add an ethyl group in the E conformer, we would start with it as an, an acetyl group because when that goes through a Wittig reaction, it makes the E conformer. And then we can take that carbonyl and reduce it all the way. So we actually have a, a, a huge degree of specificity now because we have a way to take an R group that we want to add and put it in either the E or the Z, depending on what we're trying to get to, with a very high degree of stereo specificity. And because if we did this reaction, If we did this reaction instead, as well. Now, all of a sudden, that's an electron withdrawing group. And that gives us the opposite product. We wind up with phenyl, carbon, phenyl. get that molecule instead. And that's a molecule that we can reduce, right? If we then took that and turned that into, if we expose that to hydrazine, It gets a little squished because I didn't leave myself enough room, and then expose it to what was our reagent for reducing a hydrosome? Yeah, so I have to redraw it real quick. All of a sudden, now we've got Phenyl group to carbon, to phenyl group to our double bond, to our ethyl group, but in the E configuration. Versus if we just did the one that we started with, it gives us the Z configuration. So we have to go through two extra steps, but by using an acetyl group rather than just an ethyl group attached, that gives us the ability to control with a really high degree of specificity which stereoisomer we're making. And those reactions are a lot more favorable than doing some of those others, like taking the alkyne and doing the partial reduction using that dissolving metal reaction versus a poison catalyst. Those are really tricky to use when there are other functional groups present because you wind up with a lot of other reactions happening. Um, so it 
this one because it specifically is happening at carbonyls. The carbonyl chemistry winds up being its own whole field um, of, of tools for synthesis. All right, so let's do let's do the rest of these practice problems, and then we might spend I'm trying to debate whether we want to do practice. I'll decide after class whether we're going to do synthesis practices practice in lab or if we're going to do more computational stuff in lab. So let's just work through these for now. So these first ones are just go backwards. Or you can think of it as identify the hydrolysis product for 59 and 60. So if you want to hear what I consider probably the most German name I've ever heard is Bayer's full name is Johann Friedrich Wilhelm Adolf von Bayer. Mm. Hey, there's no Rudolf in there, but there's an Adolf. So that's pretty, you know, it's about as German as you can get. Yeah. All right. So for I minds, it's pretty straightforward, right? I just can't think of Rudolph as a name without thinking of Hello Dolly. Watched that movie too many times as a, as a child, and it's one of my wife's and my kids' favorite movies. So the major D at the restaurant is Rudolph. So for I minds, you're just breaking that double bond, and that's where the carbonyl went. Right. So this. So A. Start with the cyclopentanone and cyclohexylamine. And naming for amines, we'll spend more time on it when we go over our chapter on amines. Um, if we if we get to it, um, it's basically it's identical to naming alcohols, except that. Instead of adding OL, you add amine. So instead of cyclohexanol, it's cyclohexanamine, which sounds like you're adding an extra syllable. But it's the same root. You take cyclohexane, drop the E, and then add amine. Cyclohexanamine. Or the common name would just be cyclohexylamine.
if the pi bond is on the other side, then that's where our carbonyl was. So for B, it'd be the cyclohexanone. Fast is in the wrong spot. Cyclohexanone and the cyclopental amine. Or C. So, did I put that in the right spot? Put the pipe on the other way. Okay. So we're going to break that pipe on, put the carbonyl there. Then it's just a matter of, okay, one, two, three carbons, then the nitrogen. One, two, three carbons, then the nitrogen. And that would have some really weird IAPAC name that involved parentheses. The cyclohexanone is the base. And it's got a propyl group that has an amine on it. So probably one, two, three. So three amino propyl, and that's on carbon two of the cyclohexanone. So two, three amino propyl cyclohexanone, the IUPAC name there. So naming amines as a prefix is really easy because we're all familiar with the word amino acid, right? So we're already used to using amino as a prefix. In this case, we just have to do the parentheses route. Remember when I when I promised you it was going to be easier to learn how to use the parentheses properly than to memorize isopropyl versus isobutyl? Anybody else ever go to a summer camp and have the art parks are our friends song? Is that it? Sing, say the word art parks are our friends to the tune of Yankee Doodle Dandy, and it has the same number of syllables. And so you end, you don't skip a syllable, you end right at the end of the sentence. Art parks are our friends, art parks are our friends, art parks are. Now it's the way you said that parentheses are our friends made me think of that. Sorry. <laughs> Neither here nor there. All right, if we're talking about enamines, it's a little trickier because remember, it's not the pi bond we're breaking it apart, it's the carbon nitrogen bond next to the pi bond. So we're breaking that bond and that bond and that bond. So our and that's where the carbonyl goes. So for A, it's still going to be cyclohexanone. And that molecule, which we probably name is. So if that had pi bonds there, that'd be parole, right? And so we'd probably name that just as tetrahydroparole. But it probably actually has a common name. That's probably a common enough molecule. So for B, again, we're just switching where the cyclohexyl and the cyclopentyl is. So we wind up with cyclopentanone. Yeah, something like that. And again, for this last one, it's going to be a little tricky. Pyrrolidine. 
Hold on. So our, we're going to wind up with something similar to what we had up above. Our carbonyl there. We've got a methyl group there, then three carbons, one, two, three carbons, then a nitrogen and a methyl attached to the nitrogen. And I'm not going to try to name that the IE pathway. You can do it with parentheses, but it involves getting into a new trick versus for saying when you have a methyl attached to a nitrogen, um, that's, you don't use a number for that you use. And we haven't practiced that yet. So we'll leave that alone. So 61 is basically the same question we just did. It's just presented differently. Instead of what reactants did you use to get to this product, it's what is your hydrolysis product of these, but it's the same thing. Undo the nucleophilic addition, turn it back into the carbonyl. C and D in particular, look really similar, but your product is going to be significantly different between the two of them. And 62 is a lot of fun because if you treat this with enough, there's a whole bunch of different carbonyl derivatives. You've got an enamine, you've got an acetal, you've got an imine, they could all be hydrolyzed. So what do you get when you hydrolyze all of these on the same molecule? So we'll leave those, we'll start lab by going over the answers to this one. So if you have a, a few minutes between now and lab, after you've taken a little break, um, give that a try. We'll go through 61 and 62 at the beginning of lab. There, uh, I guess you don't know. Well, either way. 